Hi there. I'm glad you've pushed my button again, and here we are listening to another day. God's precious word. He's going to use this to mold us and change us and inspire us. This is day number 279, and today I have the great privilege of reading to you Second Chronicles 32, Ecclesiastes 8, and our first reading in Matthew 21. So let's turn to Second Chronicles 32. Following that special Passover, the people went home and destroyed all the pagan shrines, and a good summary of chapter 31 is the last verse. He, Zechariah, was successful because everything he did for the temple or in observance of the law, he did in a spirit of complete loyalty and devotion to his God. Second Chronicles 32 After these events, in which King Hezekiah served the Lord faithfully, Sennacherib, the emperor of Assyria, invaded Judah. He besieged the fortified cities and gave orders for his army to break their way through the walls. When Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib intended to attack Jerusalem also, he and his officials decided to cut off the supply of water outside the city in order to keep the Assyrians from having any water when they got near Jerusalem. The officials led a large number of people out and stopped up all the springs so that no more water flowed out of them. The king strengthened the city's defenses by repairing the wall, building towers on it, and building an outer wall. In addition, he repaired the defenses built on the land that was filled in on the east side of the old part of Jerusalem. He also had a large number of spears and shields made. He placed all the men in the city under the command of army officers and had them assemble in the open square at the city gate. He said to them, Be determined and confident. And don't be afraid of the Assyrian emperor or of the army he is leading. We have more power on our side than he has on his. He has human power, but we have the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. The people were encouraged by these words of their king. Sometime later, when Sennacherib and his army were still at Lachish, he sent the following message to Hezekiah and the people of Judah who were with him in Jerusalem. I, Sennacherib, emperor of Assyria, ask what gives you people the confidence to remain in Jerusalem under siege. Hezekiah tells you that the Lord your God will save you from our power, But Hezekiah is deceiving you and will let you die of hunger and thirst. He is the one who destroyed the Lord's shrines and altars and then told the people of Judah and Jerusalem to worship and burn incense at one altar only. Don't you know what my ancestors and I have done to the people of other nations? Did the gods of any other nation save their people from the emperor of Assyria? When did any of the gods of all those countries ever save their country from us? Then what makes you think that your God can save you? Now don't let Hezekiah deceive you or mislead you like that. Don't believe him. No god of any nation has ever been able to save his people from any Assyrian emperor. So certainly this god of yours can't save you. The Assyrian officials said even worse things about the Lord God and Hezekiah, the Lord's servant. The letter that the emperor wrote defied the Lord, the God of Israel. It said, The gods of the nations have not saved their people from my power, and neither will Hezekiah's God save his people from me. The officials shouted this in Hebrew in order to frighten and discourage the people of Jerusalem who were on the city wall, so that it would be easier to capture the city. 
They talked about the God of Jerusalem in the same way that they talked about the gods of the other peoples, idols made by human hands. Then King Hezekiah and the prophet Yesiah, son of Amos, prayed to God and cried out to him for help. The Lord sent an angel that killed the soldiers and officers of the Assyrian army. So the emperor went back to Assyria disgraced. One day when he was in the temple of his god, some of his sons killed him with their swords. In this way the Lord rescued King Hezekiah and the people of Jerusalem from the power of Sennacherib, the emperor of Assyria, and also from their other enemies. He let the people live in peace with all the neighboring countries. Many people came to Jerusalem, bringing offerings to the Lord and gifts to Hezekiah, so that from then on all the nations held Hezekiah in honor. About this time King Hezekiah became sick and almost died. He prayed, and the Lord gave him a sign that he would recover. But Hezekiah was too proud to show gratitude for what the Lord had done for him, and Judah and Jerusalem suffered for it. Finally, however, Hezekiah and the people of Jerusalem humbled themselves, and so the Lord did not punish the people until after Hezekiah's death. King Hezekiah became very wealthy, and everyone held him in honor. He had storerooms built for his gold, silver, precious stones, spices, shields, and other valuable objects. In addition, he had storehouses built for his grain, wine, and olive oil, barns for his cattle, and pens for his sheep. Besides all this, God gave him sheep and cattle and so much other wealth that he built many cities. It was King Hezekiah who blocked the outlet for Gihon Spring and channeled the water to flow through a tunnel to a point inside the walls of Jerusalem. Hezekiah succeeded in everything he did, and even when the Babylonian ambassadors came to inquire about the unusual event that had happened in the land, God let Hezekiah go his own way only in order to test his character. Everything else that King Hezekiah did and his devotion to the Lord are recorded in the vision of the prophet Yesiah, son of Amos, and the history of the kings of Judah and Israel. Hezekiah died and was buried in the upper section of the royal tombs. All the people of Judah and Jerusalem paid him great honor at his death. His son Manasseh succeeded him as king. And now let's turn to Ecclesiastes 8. Yesterday's chapter of Ecclesiastes included quite a variety of Solomon's Proverbs, including these two. Verse 5, It is better to have wise people reprimand you than to have stupid people sing your praises. And verse 20, there is no one on earth who does what is right all the time and never makes a mistake. Ecclesiastes 8 Only the wise know what things really mean. Wisdom makes them smile and makes their frowns disappear. Do what the king says and don't make any rash promises to God. The king can do anything he likes, so depart from his presence. Don't stay in such a dangerous place. The king acts with authority, and no one can challenge what he does. As long as you obey his commands, you are safe, and a wise person knows how and when to do it. There is a right time and a right way to do everything, but we know so little. None of us knows what is going to happen, and there is no one to tell us. No one can keep from dying or put off the day of death. That is a battle we cannot escape. 
We cannot cheat our way out. I saw all this when I thought about the things that are done in this world, a world where some people have power and others have to suffer under them. Yes, I have seen the wicked buried and in their graves, but on the way back from the cemetery people praise them in the very city where they did their evil. It is useless. Why do people commit crimes so readily? Because crime is not punished quickly enough. A sinner may commit a hundred crimes and still live. Oh yes, I know what they say. If you obey God, everything will be all right, but it will not go well for the wicked. Their life is like a shadow and they will die young because they do not obey God. But this is nonsense. Look at what happens in the world. Sometimes the righteous get the punishment of the wicked, and the wicked get the reward of the righteous. I say it's useless. So I am convinced that we should enjoy ourselves, because the only pleasure we have in this life is eating and drinking and enjoying ourselves. We can at least do this as we labor during the life that God has given us in this world. Whenever I tried to become wise and learn what goes on in the world, I realized that you could stay awake night and day and never be able to understand what God is doing. However hard you try, you will never find out. The wise may claim to know, but they don't. Now let's turn for our first reading in Matthew 21. The first will be last, and the last first. I think we will be amazed at the justice of God's rewards, and in some sense we will all receive a fair day's pay. The meaning of that parable was matched and furthered by the story of the mother of James and John and what Jesus said to them. Matthew 21 As Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives. There Jesus sent two of us disciples on ahead with these instructions. Go to the village there ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied up with her colt beside her. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything, tell him, The master needs them, and then he will let them go at once. This happened in order to make come true what the prophet had said. Tell the city of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you. He is humble and rides on a donkey, and on a colt the foal of a donkey. So the disciples went and did what Jesus had told them to do. They brought the donkey and the colt, threw their cloaks over them, and Jesus got on. A large crowd of people spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds walking in front of Jesus and those walking behind began to shout, Praise to David's son! God bless him who comes in the name of the Lord! Praise be to God! When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was thrown into an uproar. Who is he? the people asked. The crowd answered, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Jesus went into the temple and drove out all those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the stools of those who sold pigeons and said to them, it is written in the scriptures that God said, My temple will be called a house of prayer, but you're making it a hideout for thieves. The blind and the crippled came to him in the temple, and he healed them. 
The chief priests and the teachers of the law became angry when they saw the wonderful things he was doing and the children shouting in the temple, Praise to David's son! So they asked Jesus, Do you hear what they are saying? Indeed I do, answered Jesus. Haven't you ever read this scripture when the writer said to God, You have trained children and babies to offer perfect praise. Jesus left them and went out of the city to Bethany, where he spent the night. On the way back to the city early next morning, Jesus was hungry. He saw a fig tree by the side of the road and went to it, but found nothing on it except leaves. So he said to the tree, You will never again bear fruit. At once the fig tree dried up. The disciples saw this and were astounded. How did the fig tree dry up so quickly, they asked. Jesus answered, I assure you that if you believe and do not doubt, you will be able to do what I have done to this fig tree. And not only this, but you will even be able to say to this hill, Get up and throw yourself in the sea, and it will. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Jesus came back to the temple, and as he taught, the chief priests and the elders came to him and asked, What right do you have to do these things? Who gave you such right? Jesus answered, I will ask you just one question, and if you give me an answer, I will tell you what right I have to do these things. Where did John's right to baptize come from? Was it from God or from human beings? They started to argue among themselves. What shall we say? If we answer, From God, he will say to us, Why then did you not believe John? But if we say, From human beings, we are afraid of what the people might do because they are all convinced that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We don't know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you then by what right I do these things. Please pray with me today. Lord Jesus, you are our sovereign King. You come to us so humbly, yet you are the Lord of all. So today we throw open the gates of our hearts, and, oh, if only we could give you the red carpet treatment. I'm sure that you will find our house needs cleaning. First of all, Lord, as you come into our hearts, throw out the things that keep us from making our hearts a house of prayer to you. All the filth needs to go, and even distractions. Please forgive our unclean thoughts and help us to put them to death. Thank you for what you said when your disciples asked about the fig tree. We must believe about what we are asking in prayer. Certainly, if we don't become devoted to you in prayer, doing the steps of cleansing and purification, we cannot hope to be led by your Spirit in believing. One of the things needing to be cleaned out is our selfishness. So, dear Lord, we ask you today to cleanse our hearts from all the things that make our prayers unworthy and tainted by sin. 